Our opening song this morning is Faith is a Victory. It's in your hymn book on page 608, or you may watch the screen. Today's scripture reading is John 5, 1 through 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Having five porches, in these lay a great multitude of sick people. It's first John. It's first John. Ah. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. 
For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Please bow your heads in prayer. Dear God, I ask that you join us in our worship service today, that you will be with us in everything that we do, and help us understand the sermon that is given by Mr. Mike. In Jesus' name, amen. Eminem pro poem. This M is for the manger that Christ Jesus laid at night. This M becomes a three. Backwards. For, for the three wise men bearing gifts. This M becomes a W for worship. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And the last M becomes an E, where the star was bright that night. Would anybody like to say prayer? I can say it. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for all the uh, members and the people, uh, visitors that are here, and thank you for getting us here safely. We pray that this will be a blessed day. The Pathfinders, they have a long day today, and I pray that you'll be with us and with everybody else. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.
time for family praise time. Our first song is number 618 in the hymnal, or you can follow on the monitors. We'll do verse one and two. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift on his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be. Verse 2. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The trumpet shall obey. For to the mighty conflict in this is glorious day. He had it now served him against the number four. The next one is Sweet By and By. We'll sing all the verses. It's number 428. If you want to follow in the hymnal.
next hymn is number 213. We'll do verse 1 and 2. Jesus is coming again. Everyone, could you stand, please? Stand. This is, this is a song we need to shout. Church is made up of people who have accepted God's invitation to worship and work together. Psalms 33, 21 says, For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Rejoicing and trusting is important for a healthy church. We rejoice in the Lord and in opportunity to be together. We trust in the Lord and in each other. God invites us to show our trust in him and his church by returning the tithes and offerings. The deacons will now come forward and collect them. Thank you for everything, everyone that is here today. Thank you for all the offering that we have collected, and thank you for a great Sabbath day. Amen. Amen.
Before we come before the Lord in prayer, does anybody have any thanks or requests that they'd like to bring forth? Yes, Lenise? Excellent. Yes, Elise? they would be. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Is anybody else? Okay. Any unspoken? Where possible, let us kneel before the Lord. What a pleasure it is to come before you today, Father. We just have so much to be thankful for. We really, really do, Lord. You've kept this winter at bay a little bit, and it's been great not to have so much snow like we've had in the past. And thank you for just keeping us safe and bringing us all here today. Lord, we're just worshiping you because out of praise and mercy that you've done for us and that we and you have asked us to give you the glory so we are right now lord we're giving you all the glory because you are holy just loving and great and wonderful and good there's no adjectives that can really describe you father not adequate ones anyway we just thank you for sending the holy spirit today and we especially thank you for the pathfinders that they have a sabbath to to um, show their talents, Lord, and to take part of the service. We thank you for the young, the young people, Lord, because they will be older soon, and they will be taking our places one of these days, but we thank you for giving them in their youth, and that you will bless each one of them today, Lord. A special blessing, please. For those who are not here, Lord, we ask that you be with them. If there's sickness, traveling, we don't know what the issues are, but we ask that you protect each person that is not here. We ask that you give them a Sabbath day blessings also. Father, we have nothing but praises this morning for you. Lenise is feeling a whole lot better, and Elisa's sister did not have to have the surgery like they thought she would, and we give you all the praise and glory for this. Amen. We've raised our hands, Lord, in unspoken prayers and requests, and you know what they are, and we ask that you honor them according to your will. And Lord, we pray especially for our nation today, Lord, for our president and who's ever up in the government, Lord. We just uplift them because there's just so much stuff going on in this world showing that you will be coming soon, Lord. Keep our faith strong that we may be always watching and always waiting for you, not to fall asleep, but to keep our faith and trust in you. Father, we ask once again for the Holy Spirit to anoint our minds and that you would also anoint Mike's lips and his mind also as he brings the word to us this morning. May we have understanding and we thank you again for hearing us. We thank you for Jesus who has died to save us and that is our Redeemer and our King. For we ask these things in his precious and holy name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath. Our next scripture, scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Good morning. Good morning. A beautiful Sabbath day. It's great to be here. Amen. How many here this morning, I want you to raise your hands, can read or know someone who can read? <laughs> then this message is for you this morning. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Dear Father, I thank you so much that you are with us and that you are in our midst here this morning and that your word has been given this morning to me. And I pray that you will allow only your words to be heard, only you to be presented, and may we come closer to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Luke eight twenty-two through 25, is an account of a story that shows up in other Gospels as well. And I want us to look at it real quickly this morning. Just as a, this is just a starting point. Luke 8, 22 through 25. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat and his disciples, with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, sounds like it must have been a big boat, doesn't it? <laughs> they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the waters, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the waters to obey him. What a story. I've preached on this story before. There's so much to learn from here. But I want us to look at the question that Jesus asked them after they woke him up. He calmed everything down, and he said, where is your faith? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Where is your faith? And maybe we'll come back to the, to the answer as to why Jesus would ask that question of the disciples. But we ask ourselves that question because we struggle at times. We know what the message says, what the Bible says about how we're to live. We know how we're supposed to treat people. We know the things that we're supposed to do and we're not supposed to do. And then we end up doing it. We turn around, we, we get cut off by somebody in our car, and we get angry at them and do whatever it is that we do. Um, we... We want to do, we know there are things that we shouldn't be doing. There's habits that we have, things that we partake of that, that we know we shouldn't be doing, but we do it. And afterwards we say, Lord, forgive me and, and help me. I think Jesus would ask us, where is your faith? Where is your faith? What is faith anyway? What's the definition of faith? Exactly. Uh, Sue's quoting Hebrews 11.1, 1, and that's our biblical answer, isn't it? Do we know what it means? Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 1. If I can go to the right place with it here. I walked out without my Bible this morning, so I'm using one from the church. Anybody who's had a Bible for a long time knows that you know how it opens. <laughs> it kind of opens in certain ways for you. It's easier to find things in your Bible than it is in, in a different one. 
Sounds like an excuse, doesn't it? <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 1. Okay, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 13. It's got to be in the middle. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do we know what that means? It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so it sounds to me like where it is something ethereal that we're seeing, faith allows it to be real. It's substance. It's something that we can hold on to and grab hold of. So faith turns the things that we want, the things that we know that God wants for us, into reality. Does that sound right? I think it is. I think that's what it is. So faith is what turns, by the power of God, things that we only hope for and imagine into reality. And, uh, and then later, and I love this chapter. I know I've said it before when I'm up here. I love chapter 11 of Hebrews. Later on, in beginning with chapter 5, where he talks about Enoch being translated and not seeing death. For he had this testimony that he pleased God, and then in the next verse it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We want to please God, don't we? We need to find that faith that Jesus is asking where it is on our behalf. Where is our faith? We need to find it. Ephesians 2.8 says, Tells us where it comes from. Where does faith come from anyway? Where do you find faith? It comes from God, doesn't it? I heard someone say, I couldn't tell who was saying it. Ephesians 2 8 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The grace and the faith are both gifts of God. Everything that we get is a gift of God, and it comes straight from Him. In 2 Corinthians 5 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We're doing a little bit of a little study on faith here at the beginning. So we get a feel for what Scripture says, and then I want us to see if we can figure out a way to get a handle on it and make it our own. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Man. It says, For we walk by faith. Not by sight. Now when he says we, this is Paul writing this to Corinthians, he's talking to Christians, right? Believers in God and in Christ. And he's saying that we as Christians walk by faith, not by sight. I'm afraid that too often we walk by sight and not by faith. Don't we? We need to learn how that we can become the same, the person that Paul's talking about here, and that we walk by faith and not by sight as well. I think we have an idea of what faith is about. All things are possible to him who believes, Jesus said, right? When Jesus came, was in the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil, how did he come back? He came back with it is written, didn't he? And, and Paul in Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Philippians says, It's God who works in you. It gives you the power to do, to want and to do. James says, Faith without works is dead. Matthew, Jesus commended the centurion for having great faith. Because he didn't require that Jesus go there. He knew that if he could speak, it would happen. He had faith in him. He believed. And in 1 John 5, 4, the song that we sang at the beginning, faith is a victory that overcomes the world. We've got to find this faith. We've got to find this faith. But our faith too often turns out like this story. I want to share with you, what, what, what is this? String with a with a roll of tape on it. But if you were to, 
I don't have the microphone on, so I don't want to get too far away from the podium. But if you do this, what does that now become? A pendulum, a pendulum right? right? Now, there's some interesting facts about a pendulum that we can draw a lesson from. Maybe that illustrates who we are more often than not. The law of the pendulum states that a pendulum can never return to a point higher than it was released from. Does that make sense? So if I release this pendulum from up here, it swings over here, it's going to come back lower. And each time, because of gravity and because of friction, it becomes a shorter distance until it reaches a point of equilibrium where all the forces are acting together and it's stopped, right? It's standing still. Well, there was a student in a, in a speech class that was asked to, to do a lesson, to give a speech where he taught a lesson, and he took the law of the pendulum, and then he asked the class, after doing a demonstration sort of like what I just did, <clears throat> he asked them, how many of you believe in the law of the pendulum? How about here? How many believe in the law of the pendulum? I believe in the law of the pendulum. That it, that's the way it works. That's physics, right? Everybody in the class raised their hand. Yes, we believe in the law of the, of the pendulum, including the teacher. Everybody raised their hand. <clears throat> well, at this point, the principal, the, the teacher gets up and starts towards the front because, because he thinks that the lesson's over. But the student says, no, well, no, wait. I want you to come up here and I want you to sit in a chair right here inside the classroom with your back against the wall. And he goes to this pendulum that he had set up in the center of the room that had a 250-pound weight on it. And he brought this pendulum over to the teacher's nose. And he said, by the law of the pendulum, you're safe. Because when I let this go, it will come back a shorter distance away from you, and you're safe. There's no way that you can get hurt. Right? So he takes it up to his nose, and he lets it go. And it swings all the way across up to reach its point, and it seems to stop for a moment, and it starts swinging back. And at that point, the teacher dove off the chair because he was unsure whether that law of the pendulum was going to hold true in this case. How often do we do that? We believe that God will enable us to do anything that we ask. Anything, and I've said it so many times before, God's biddings are enablings. Not original, but there's a popular, a, a, a well-known phrase, the spirit of prophecy. God's biddings are enablings. That means that anything that he asks you to do, he's promising within that request the ability to do it. And we still fail. And we still find ourselves in situations where the pendulum is coming at us and we know it's not going to hit us, but we're diving off the chair. We're bailing out because we just believe it. But do we? I think that what I really believe, I do. True? I think that's the situation that we're in. Too often, we believe something, but when we're faced with a choice of doing or not doing, we do the wrong thing. And praise God that we have a, a, a Savior who, if we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? If we confess our sins, there's always a... One thing about um, the promises of God, the, the, the Bible is full of promises of God promising to take care of us and to make us into the person, the exact person that he wants and expects us to be. They all have conditions, you know. We need to watch the condition and do what it says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive it. If we don't confess it, we won't be forgiven. And all, many, many, most of the, the, um, the promises have such 
conditions. So what do we do to stop this from happening? Because I believe with all my heart that God does not expect us to live our whole lives in this same condition. I've always believed that. But it's like the pendulum, <laughs> you know? You believe it, but you're not always sure, and you don't always stay with it. It doesn't always go the way that you think it was. Hebrews 4, verse 12, that Alyssa shared with us this morning. Points us in the direction of the answer. To how we can overcome our unbelief. Our lack of belief in God and what he can do for us says in Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Excuse me. The two-edged sword was a popular weapon in the Romans, for the Romans, during the time of the New Testament. The Romans used it uh, in close hand-to-hand -hand combat with a shield. They'd hold up the shield and push away, and they'd be able to get around and, and do what they needed to do in order to win the victory. And so Paul here is using a, an example that they were familiar with. And they knew what he was talking about when they said that. In Ephesians, he told the Ephesian church, Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10, said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We've got to recognize that we're, we're in a battle in our day-to-day -day life. And God wants us to be one way, but there's a, an enemy, as Pastor said last week, that wants us to do a different thing and to go a different way. Therefore, Paul says, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Where do we learn truth? In the Bible. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Where do we get righteousness? From Christ, don't we? Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. The story of God's love that's so great for us that he gave everything in order to bring us back to him. Above all, taking the shield of faith, that nebulous thing that we're battling with, trying to understand the shield of faith that will protect us, that will guide, guard us from the, the, as it says, Paul says, be able to quench all the fiery, fiery darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, Again, a gift from God, right? We're saved by grace, not by faith. By grace through faith. That's the, that's the, the <laughs> I don't think I have the words in the right order, but that's the message. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What's a consistent theme through all of those things? Faith. The Word. The Word is the behind it all. I've always felt a need to know Scripture. I know Scripture pretty well. But I can't tell you where, I, where the verses came from. If somebody starts reading a verse, I can finish it for you. 
you know? Have an idea where, it's, where maybe it's probably written. And I always knew that I had a concordance so I could go get it and I could find out where it is, right? And, and, and I convinced myself that that's what experts do, isn't it? You don't have to know everything. You just have to know where to find it. I'm not sure anymore if that's true. I always had doubts about it. I always admired people who could spout off verses with their references, you know, thinking that they had something special that I don't have, you know. You know, maybe they have this photographic memory. Some do, but most don't. Maybe they have some kind of photographic memory that allows them to remember all these things and, that I don't have and God didn't bless me with. Howard Rutledge was an American fighter pilot. He was flying an F-8 Crusader on a mission over North Vietnam, so it was some time ago, when he was shot down by enemy gunfire. Enemy soldiers saw him parachuting down into the jungle, and they tried to take him out then as he was floating down, but he survived. But as soon as he landed, they hunted him down and captured him and put him in prison. They took him, he spent seven years at the infamous Hanoi Hilton, five of those in solitary confinement, where he had nothing to occupy him but his own misery and the thoughts in his mind. Five years. His bed was a concrete slab. There was no light. He said that spiders crawled around him as big as his fist. His legs were shackled with spurs. His arms were pulled around behind his head, and his face was shoved down into his own waist. Rats scampered around the size of small cats. There was no heat, and all of his clothes were taken away. So he had nothing to protect him from the elements. But what Howard says was the worst thing that he suffered through all of that was the fact that he had neglected to commit to memory any of the word of God besides one verse. He said, I never dreamed I would spend almost seven years in a, in a North Vietnamese prison. Or that thinking about one memorized Bible verse could make the whole day bearable. One verse that he's memorized and he clung to it made a whole day bearable over and over again. That was the greatest remorse that he, that he had, that he didn't commit to memory any other Bible verses. And I could guess it was John 3.16, since most people know that. He had nothing but what was stored in his mind. If we were to do an inventory of what was stored in our minds at the moment, that would frighten us, I think. It might frighten us to think of how we, were, we would face something like that. He said that he would pray and hum hymns, hymns silently and think about what that one verse meant to him over and over again. He said that the enemy knew that the best way to break a man's resistance was to crush his spirit in a lonely cell. He said also, scripture and hymns might be boring to some, but it was the way we conquered our enemy and overcame the power of death around us. We know from, from prophecy that a time will come when we too could be in that situation. And we have our phones. I don't know where mine is now. We have our phones, you know, what a phenomenal thing that technology does for us today. Uh, you know, I used to have a little tiny Bible, but at 60 years old, you know, I can't read the little bitty print in a little Bible this big. But now we got phones, you know, and I can blow it up big, size that I want to, whatever size I need, and I can find all of Scripture. I can have all of the Spirit of Prophecy books. I can have anything at my fingertips with one electronic device. But we know things aren't always going to be the way they are today. They're not always going to have the freedom and the availability that we have. All it takes is one electromagnetic pulse and it wipes out every, all the electronics that we have. 
that anybody has. And right there, it's all gone. We have nothing. The only thing that nobody can ever take from you is what you've stored away in your mind. And so, I want to make this message this morning a very practical one. I want to encourage everyone to memorize Scripture. And I've taken that on myself as well, as a, as a desire and a hope and a plan to keep working, to memorize Scripture. Now, I've tried it before. It's like running. <laughs> I never have been very successful at running. But there are ways to make memorizing Scripture easier. No other way other than repetition, right? Constant repetition is the only way that you can really memorize anything. And I have, I have a friend who's memorized chapters and books of the Bible. And his method that he likes is the, the index card. You know, he writes it out, and, and then he just goes over and over and over and over it again. But I found recently in my studies that there's apps available for that. Can you imagine that? There's one that I found that's very helpful that I've found that I've started using. It's called Scripture Typer. So if you have an electronic device that you can get apps on, a phone or a tablet or whatever, even your computer, you can get it, hunt up Scripture Typer and download it. On, there's a free version. There's also a paid version. But you, it helps you. You pick the verses that you want to read and you type it out. You don't have to type the whole thing, which is very helpful because if you had to type out every word in its entirety, you'd get stuck on the letters, you know. But, but since you, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you have to type in I, T, B, and, and it lets you do it, you know, and it shows you that you're doing it. If you get it wrong, it indicates that you've gotten it wrong. You go back and you do it again. And then you have, it has a memorized section where it gives you every other word, where you type it in and you have to fill it in. You hit it to memorize again and it flops it around, so you, you have to learn different ones until... Finally, you master it phase where it's just blank, and you just start typing it in. It's, it's very helpful. It's something that's very helpful to be able to learn Scripture because I want to tell you that there may and likely will come a time when all we are going to have is what's in our minds. All we're going to have is what we remember. And besides that, I want to read Psalm 119. Verse 11. And to me, this is, this is the verse that David writes that, that just... Is it 119.11? It pulls all of this together, this thought that I've been dealing with. Psalm 119.11, it says, Your word have I hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. When Jesus was standing in the face to face with the devil, and, this, and Satan threw temptations at him that were real temptations, there was something that he could have and would have grabbed onto had he not known Scripture. He was able to come back with the word right away. Second Peter, it says, um, let me find it. I, you see that I haven't memorized them yet. There's all kinds of people that have memorized great things. Remember HMS Richards, one of the great Adventist preachers from years gone by. They said that he was up preaching as he got older and somebody that was sitting behind him noticed something unusual about what was going on there. And so he peeked up and to see what it was that, that caught his eye and his Bible was upside down. And HMS Richards was up there flipping from passage to passage and, and reading out, reading out the, the scripture with his Bible upside down. He knew his scripture. They said that J.N. Andrews, another early Seventh-day Adventist, that 
he was known as the walking Bible. He said that when he was pressed, he didn't want to, you know, it wasn't like he was going around talking about it, but when he was pressed and said, well, if you, how much of it do you know? He said, if the New Testament was all taken away from us completely today, I could reproduce the whole thing. Um, word for word, from memory. And the Old Testament, he said, I could almost do the Old Testament. Not sure if he could quite do it. Jonathan Huss, one of the early reformers, he was, when they were taking him and trying him, they said, we're going to take away all your books. You're not going to be able to have any books. He said, I don't care if you give me any books or not. He said, I could quote the entire Bible, save Chronicles, except the books of Chronicles. I can say it by memory. What do they have that we don't have? Time. One of Satan's things, you know. He wants to make sure that we don't have any time. Get us so wrapped up and so busy with all the things that we have to do, important things, you know. We've got to go to work. We've got to go to school. We've got to do our homework. We've got to do side work. We've got to do everything under the sun. We've got to do church. We've got to do everything. I don't have time. They had the same amount of time that we have. They just chose to use it differently. They didn't have the distractions, I'll admit. <laughs> I'll admit. Didn't have all these iPhones and everything. And when we pick up our iPhone, we get the app, we get the app for scripture typer and for memorizing scripture. Sitting right beside it is that old game that we like playing, you know. And so we might have to take some of those off. <laughs> At least move it to another page or something so that we're not so distracted by it. Can you imagine Jesus having to, when he's standing there in front of Satan coming up with scripture, having to say, well, wait a minute, I need to go to my concordance and see where this, what, exactly what this says so that I can say it, present it to you properly. I don't think so. I don't think so. God's telling me, and, and I hope he's telling you maybe, think about it, that I need to spend more time in his word Less time doing all the other things, even if it's church things. I need to spend more time with him and in his word, hiding his word in, his, in my heart that I might not sin against him. Amen. Our closing song will be 524 in the hymnal. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. You can stand, please.
Pathfinder induction service at the end of this meeting. It'll start about 15 minutes to allow anyone who's not, you know, can't stay by to slip out. But we invite everyone to stay by because we have some new Pathfinders that we want to welcome into our club and in, in the service and, and everybody that can stay by and support them would be a great thing. So I appreciate that. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Father, we just thank you so much for Jesus, the living word, and the written word that you've given us. I pray, Lord, that we may spend more time in it, that we may learn it, it may become part of us, that we may be your servants and may be transformed into your likeness. Bless us for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.